Hey everyone, it's Christopher Swan and welcome to this week's episode of Living Your Journey. Each week I have this amazing opportunity to chat with people that love what they do in life. They understand their passions and their direction. Maybe it's a career path or it's the social impact that they're making. It's kind of like they're following the North Star, but they know their story may change and they understand that they're on a journey every day. The guest this week is Peter Pappas, the founder of Blade and Blue, an American clothing brand founded in San Francisco, specializing in heritage-inspired men's clothing. Peter has been a longtime leader in fashion design and merchandising, working with global brands ranging from outlet and mass merchandise to high-end luxury. He's used his knowledge and experiences along with his dream to create something different to launch Blade and Blue in 2013. Peter shares his inspiration and reason for starting this company, how he's put in the hard work to create a brand that continues to find fans around the world, and what's next in his journey. We also discuss his unique approach to marketing, style, and how he connects Blade and Blue to the LGBTQ organizations and movements that are meaningful to Peter. He even peppers in sound advice for anyone ready to tackle their dreams. Peter is full of energy loves what he does, and both easily come through in our conversation. This was a really fun interview, and now I can't wait to see how Peter rocks his future. Everyone, meet Peter. Peter, it's great to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thanks, Christopher. It's really nice to be here as well. So it's terrific having you on the show because... I think, like I've told you this earlier, that I've been following your brand for a while, and I think it's this wonderful brand, Blade and Blue, and you've become this admired company online and in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm-hmm. So it's been fun to watch it evolve. Like, I kind of look at it as like this dream that's evolving in front of my eyes when I've done enough research to figure out that it was you that was doing this. <laughs> so, so I'd love to just kind of like, maybe you just jump in about Blade and Blue and maybe talk about kind of a little bit of the back history. Could, sure. you, could you first tell me um, a little bit about like, how do you describe Blade and Blue? And then how did it start? Sure. Well, uh, I guess I describe it as inspired by the old school and tailored for the new school. And that seems a little bit maybe uh, rehearsed and staged, but it's kind of how I actually think about it. The real inspiration for Blade and Blue came when I was looking at really old pictures of my father and my grandfather in these old photo albums. And what struck me was how contemporary they looked. And these pictures were taken 1953, 1952. But those guys could have walked right out of the pages of those uh, photo albums and just like been in San Francisco today. I mean, they looked so current. There was something so striking about it because it just made me think about like the timelessness of just great style. So I always take inspiration from things in the past. And um, that's everything from not only the clothing, but even on the website, there's like a whole vintage section, which has become this just crazy little section. It's like the little <laughs> section that could. It basically started with me. Just I go to flea markets and garage sales and all that kind of hoarder-like stuff on the weekends. That's sort of my <laughs> hobby. And then I put them up for sale. And it's really things that I think sort of um, kind of complement the clothing that I make as well. So um, for me, I describe it but as things that are inspired by the past but made for the new generation. Um, And that's everything, like I said, from the clothing, but also to sort of these like beautiful old watches or tie clips, sort of things that like needed a home and needed to find a new life. And now they actually have a new life because people are discovering them. Um, And that sort of actually relates to the name of the brand too, uh, Blade and Blue. Um, The name Blade and Blue comes from one of my dogs. Uh, He was in shelter and his name was Lonesome Blue because he was so sad. That's what they called him, Lonesome Blue. And he was so sad in that shelter. Um, I t- we took him home and he's just become this incredible dog. He's this border collie. So he's got all this energy. He's so athletic. I mean, he can catch a ball on a fly from like all the way across the baseball field. He's <laughs> awesome. But here he was, this little dog that was lonesome and blue. And we named him Blade because he's got this like white blade of fur on his black face. But Blade is also this like really strong word, right? It's strong, it's sharp, it's powerful, it's even threatening. Um, and so to see him go from being 
blue to being blade is just this awesome like new lease on life and that's sort of uh i think uh correlated to the original inspiration of like taking things from the past uh, maybe that need a new mm. home and, and finding a new lease on life for them so that's sort of a little bit beh- about behind the scenes of uh what kind of started blade and blue it really came from those very very first pictures that i saw of my dad and my granddad that i just was just haunted by and i, I just thought i had to do something with this idea did you feel like that was also something that was maybe even missing in the in the market because you guys you talked about the vintage element uh, on the yeah. website but there a lot of what you focus on is also it's clearly men's apparel and accessories sure. and things like this yeah. did you feel like there was something missing in the market that you wanted to bring to life or at least share your voice in that market here's what i think i wanted to do more than anything was bring something human to the market. That is what I felt like was missing more than anything else. Um, I'm not saying that I don't think my shirts are the best. I do. I'm not saying that <laughs> I don't think my ties are the best and really the way I combine the shirts and the ties with those accessories. I think that's a very, very unique thing that I do. But what I thought was missing the most in the market was the idea that there's a human behind the products that you are bringing into your life. And this is what I think separates me maybe a little bit from the pack. And what I mean by that is a really good example of it is if you look at the reviews section of the website or even on Instagram, people post the thank you note that they get written by me with their order. They mm-hmm. post it and they say, I can't believe that the owner of the company or that the guy who designed this shirt wrote me a note to say thank you. And that was exactly what I wanted to do when I started this whole thing. Because let's be honest, there's a ton of places where you can buy buy shirts and ties and and whatever. But the fact that people can feel that there's an actual soul behind the product that actually makes it makes the product even more special for them and makes them appreciate the product a little bit more and i take a lot of pride in that and it's actually a ton of work for me to write those note cards for, for everybody i mean sometimes i mean i don't i mean maybe i shouldn't say this but sometimes i'm like oh no another order just came in like i can't even keep up sometimes <laughs> with those notes But for me, it's like if I can't take a minute out of my life to thank somebody for discovering my site out of all the hundreds and thousands of choices that they have, if I can't take a minute out of my life to say thank you to them, then what am I doing this for? You know, I should go sell insurance or something, you know. So that's what I maybe thought was beyond the product piece. I do definitely think that I've got a unique point of view with like how I put things together. But. I really wanted this to feel like there was a soul behind what I'm doing. That makes a lot of sense. I've never heard it in that perspective. I I mean, not for, I think, maybe clothing or Mm -hmm. fashion apparel. You know, I've I've heard that with, you know, small organizations. They want that connection with the customers. And I see that especially when it's like a brick to mortar. Right. But not right. maybe this. And I've seen some personal things like you get, uh, uh, like I'll order something and I get the packaging's really interesting and different. And there's just, you know, things in there that I didn't expect, which, but I've never, I don't think ever received a card. That's, I don't, I don't know if men are used to being treated like that. That's uh-huh. maybe another thing on top of that. I think like maybe women have more experience or more options with mm. boutiques or higher end retailers. I get notes from guys all the time saying they've never been treated like this before. And that makes me feel like I am doing the right thing. Um, Yeah, I just wanted to feel like there was a connection, like a human connection between the work I was doing and the people that were appreciating what I was doing. You know, part of what made me start this company in the first place was feeling a little bit dehumanized by what I was doing during the day where I was designing and merchandising for a really large clothing company. And that job is awesome. And the company is awesome. And I've loved working there. I've been there for almost 15 years. Mm. I love it. And I wouldn't change that experience for anything. However, sometimes I felt like, wow, sometimes my work is reduced to the cost of something or um, a big pile in the sale rack or maybe a sales associate that doesn't even really care about the product that they're putting on that shelf. That was where for me, 
I maybe fell off the train a little bit and wanted to explore the idea of something a little different. Uh, that I think makes a lot of sense where you just really wanted to bring to life. Yeah. Your, well, it, you wanted to bring to life your voice, but also have a bigger value, you know, like in control of it. I think a lot of us that have worked in large organizations can sometimes feel a little bit like, like the number game. It's yeah. either reduced to the number or I'm a number in the big scheme Absolutely. of things. Yeah. And you know, in big business that does make sense. I'm not trying to discredit that. Of course not. At all. Sure. It makes sense. And, and it's probably, uh, what is it? The necessary evil. But after a while, um, especially when you're a creative type, it, it's enough. And for me, at, at, at a certain point, it, it had been enough. And I really just wanted to try something different. Had you always kind of had that, like, itch to do something different, being creative? You know, or, or did you see your original trajectory working at a large organization and, and you know, kind of pursuing your, your dream in that way? I think for me, it was the lacking the confidence when I was younger, to do something like this. Um, you know, I remember one of my uh, jobs before I, I moved out to California was working at um, at Kate Spade and Jack Spade. And, you know, when I started working there, I didn't know a thing about women's accessories. I mean, I have no experience in that at all. Um, but I really knew what the brand was about. And I knew what Kate Spade herself wanted to see in her stores. A lot of times people would send me jewelry or, you know, things that they wanted her to see, to carry in the store. And a lot of times I would show her, a lot of times I wouldn't show her mm. because I thought I was very in tune with what her brand was. And that just speaks to the power of what she was trying to do and, and, and the power of her vision. And I remember thinking to myself, I would love to do something like this one day, but I don't think I have that certain thing like for her it was like the quirky mod girl you know the uptown mod girl yeah. that was her thing and it was awesome and it is awesome um and i never thought for me personally oh i don't i'm not that let's say unique that i have something different to say and i don't know when i turned the corner and and said to myself no i actually do have it um i think it was more of a like a little snowball effect. Like I think over time I took different experiences and sort of rolled them together and then came to a point and, you know, then I go back to those, the picture of my dad and my granddad. And I think it all sort of came to a head and said, all of these experiences uh, uh, have now formed this thing that I think is, that I know is my vision. And um, so I think in the past, I think it was always there, but I would never have had the confidence to really um, do anything with it. And even with that said, it's really scary now to do anything with it. I mean, when the site first launched, I was really nervous. I mean, you just, I didn't want it to fail. I didn't want people mm -hmm. to laugh at it. I didn't want people to think, who does he think he is thinking that he can do something like this? Um, you know, it was very, very intimidating. And I will be, I will be honest too. Like I am just about to launch the new spring season and I'm still intimidated and I'm still really nervous that no one's going to like it. I mean, it's just, it, it, there is maybe a confidence factor um, in there, but at some point something triggered something in me that said, you got to do this and you've got to do it now so get off your butt and just do it <laughs> i actually i really resonate with all that oh, cool. I, I, and I i like that you also just said that like it hasn't gone away that you still have some of that that it almost to me doesn't seem like it's confidence it's almost like you just you know you're anxious about like are people going to really like the new line or the new stuff sure. that you're doing um yeah. and you know you, it's not like you've been around for a ton of years too. I think what you started the uh, site in 2013. Yeah. So it's, um, I think it's about, it's a little over four years now. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, yeah, it definitely has not been, um, too long. Well, let me take a step back to what I didn't ask was, um, sure. why fashion? Like why design for you? Well, it's like, what's the motivator mm -hmm. behind that for you? Well, you know, it's interesting. If you probably would have asked Peter in high school, or college, he would not have said that he would be in 
fashion and clothing and that sort of thing. He would have said, Peter's going to go into the music business. That was what I really wanted to do with my life. I wanted to either be a music journalist or I wanted to work at a record record company or a Billboard magazine, like something like that. I'm really into music. I'm a really, really passionate uh, music fan. And I always thought that's what, what I was going to do with my life. Then I graduated college and wanted to move out of my parents' house. I was living in New York. I was living in Staten Island at the time, commuting back and forth to NYU. That's where I went to school. And you know, the first thing on my mind was, okay, I got to get out of my parents' house. And then the reality of the salaries came into play. <laughs> and I knew I was not going to be able to move out of my parents' house uh, working at a record label. So um, I had worked in a variety of retail stores throughout high school and college. And um, I was definitely definitely interested in it. And um, I got a job. My very first job was working at Lord & Taylor. Yeah. Um, and the pay was enough to get me out of my parents' house. And that sort of put me on this path. And I think maybe I adapted my passion for music to um, the fashion industry. And really, there's so much to get uh, inspired by that, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know how I couldn't have been really, really moved by the talented people that I was working with and have worked with over the years. I mean, um, I think the creativity that I had been surrounded by, I mean, that was probably a huge motivator in itself. That's a real interesting shift there, but I do see I see this a lot, even with myself or with others, that creative avenues can kind of blend or evolve. Yeah. Because I even think, and I don't know who does this for you, but like even looking at your editorial on your website, and the, I mean, it kind of makes sense now too. You also write these cards to everybody. So I mean, yep. so you're still doing a little bit of writing. You're still doing all these things um, that you kind of talked about. I would almost imagine that music might help inspire you even with like some of that kind of look or, or things that you are also going for. It's got to be a, a part somewhere. Sure. I'm always trying to get my record collection into the pictures. <laughs> I didn't know that really. <laughs> some way, somehow, I'm always trying to get the records uh, into some of the pictures. That's, I think I think when we just took the one of Brian down where he was uh, in the boxer shorts. Oh, with yeah. Records surrounded, surrounded by a bunch of records. And that was a really cool shot. Um, yeah, it is funny though, like, some of the internet trolls saying things like he wasn't even born when those records were made. And part of me is like, well, isn't that the point? <laughs> I mean, isn't it great that he's that young and he can appreciate something that was made before his time. And again, the timelessness of something beautiful, the timelessness of something great. It doesn't end. Like, it keeps going to be appreciated continually. So I don't know. I I just think yeah. I'm I I definitely think that music has a big part in uh in in what I do. The creative element of it. Sure. I mean, whether it's getting inspired by an old record jacket or you know an outfit that a musician wore or a movement of time in music. I mean, who kn who knows? But I definitely think it's it's in there some way. You you just mentioned also Brian, you know, one of, I know he's your friend. He's also um, has become kind of this face of some of your, um, the look and the brand. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about um, your marketing and the models, because okay. I think there's a, a specific uniqueness to this that um, people that aren't familiar with the brand wouldn't know this, but you have this a, a very specific aesthetic that's different than mainstream Yeah. and um, you stand out in a different way. And mm -hmm. You know, besides the point of I just want to be different, I'm I'm curious about the why. Why, why use specific type of models, specific mm -hmm. looks, and that kind of aesthetic? What are you mm -hmm. aiming for there? Sure, it. I think it all goes. It's a all parallel line. I think it's all a set of parallel lines. I mean, the boys in the pictures are people from the neighborhood. They're guys that I know. They're guys that I'm friends with. And if I maybe don't know them that well they're like really good friends with some of the other boys. It's we're all sort of connected to each other. The last thing in the universe I ever wanted to do was hire some model who has no connection to me at all and pay them to stand there and look nice and look rather generic. And that's it, you know, and I kind of think that's what most companies 
do. And a lot of these models are actually used by several different companies. I mean, I see the same models for a lot of these really big corporations. I mean, God, does it get any more boring than that? <laughs> it's just like, like ugh, I just, I, I don't really understand it. For me, it's the parallel line. Everything is a parallel line to the idea of it being human. I really wanted Blade and Blue to be almost seen like a person in a way. And I don't mean that in a Mitt Romney sort of way where a corporation is a person. <laughs> but it goes back to like the idea that this brand has a soul. And mm -hmm. you know, whether it's not whether it's you're seeing my records in the pictures or, you know, sometimes the best pictures come not when we're like I, you know, I come to the set with like a variety of positions or poses or some, something specific that I'm looking for. And that's sort of just a framework for the day. But most of the time, the best pictures come when like I've cracked a dirty joke and the boys are taken off guard and we just capture that like really, really genuine spirit. And that to me was the most important thing. The reason why the models look like they do is because they're gen genuine and they're authentic and they're real guys and i think people can relate to them they can feel like oh i know that guy or i know a guy just like him and i think there's something maybe more likable but really to me it's that it's just more human than the other companies out there which i think just play things by the rule book and i've done that in my career and i didn't want to do that anymore i really wanted it to feel like you know this brand because mm -hmm. you really can identify with everything, like this, the, 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 the writing. I'm not a professional writer at all. I'm sure a professional copywriter would look at my website and die. <laughs> 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 I know they would because I, I'm not a professional writer. But I wanted it to feel like a conversation. So yeah. sometimes I'm writing things on the website and I'll, I'll say something like, I mean, come on, guys, look at this fabulous watch or something like that. And like, I'm just like, that's what's in my head. That's how I want to talk to somebody. Well, that's what's what I'm going to write. And I don't think a lot of people would do that. Um, but that's sort of the beauty about doing things on your own. You could do whatever you want to do. It's really true. And it also, I think it's the perfect time for you because that style of conversational writing is actually, that is what people want online. And people want a engagement and conversation because we're kind of over the big brands and mm -hmm. it's a one way street. So it's probably like perfect timing for you to, to, to actually do it because it's real. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Look, I'm on trend. Who knew? Right? <laughs> I'm here to tell you. <laughs> you know, over the years, too, I've noticed that you've supported different LGBTQ organizations and yeah. the community. You know, sure. it's from a pop-up to supporting, like, the Matthew Shepard to just multiple things. Yeah. I, it's another why question. It's mm -hmm. the, um, w like, maybe why why the community mm. um, or why even, like, yeah, why those communities sure. and why even do it? Good question. And I get one question I get often is, are you targeting gay guys? And my answer to that is no. However, again, I'm a human being and I really have decided at this point in my life, I spent a really long time doing things for everybody else. I did what my parents wanted me to do. I did what corporations wanted me to do. This point in my life, I'm just going to be myself and be comfortable with that. I can't be anything else except for who I am. Can I, can I pause you there for a second and just say I yeah. love that, Peter? I love, uh -oh. I just love that you just said that. Thanks. Because it's, you couldn't be more honest about why why you're doing what you do. So anyways, I'm sorry to pause you. I hey, just. I, I thought you were going to tell me that was a bad answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, gosh, that's just so great. Just like, it's like, there's no excuse anymore. I'm just going to be who I am. So. Right. And I'm not, and I'm not like, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to be anything other than just who I am. So, you know, the reason why the Matthew Shepard thing has been very important to me was a long time ago when we were first starting out. And again, I'm first starting out. I'm a guy in my basement. We were taking pictures of the boys 
in my basement, you know, with my friend who's a photographer who's giving me like an incredible deal on his professional photography rates. You know, I'm cashing in every favor in the universe that I have. I'm cashing out my 401k to start this company. I mean, I'm putting everything on the line, mm -hmm. right? And it's really scary. And then there's that confidence thing that comes into like, are people even going to like what I'm doing? What am I doing? Right? You get all this doubt. And then, you know, there was one of those moments where, again, there was a staged picture that I had in mind with the two models who were dating at the time. And the two of them, we caught them on an, like an unrehearsed and an unplanned moment. It was actually a test photo. And the photo itself was, was beautiful. And it was the two of them just hugging. They were like, sort of like just resting on each other, right? Because, you know, it is actually hard to like, be in front of that camera for a couple hours. I mean, it's just like, you know, you've got me over there saying, you know, needing you to look good. And, you know, it, it, it actually is pretty difficult. So they were just taking a, re a rest. And John snapped the camera and it came up on the screen. And I was like, wow, that is a beautiful picture. Again, I think it was probably more honest and more genuine than maybe some of the more staged pictures. So I put that picture up on Instagram and like you have maybe discovered with me in the last couple of weeks, I am not really that technologically savvy. <laughs> put it up on Instagram was maybe one of the first pictures that I even put up on Instagram. And oh boy, I did not expect um, such really awful things to be written. Not only oh. even just on the actual picture itself, but emails to me, phone calls. I mean, I was really, really floored. Um, I think for me, it was a huge wake up call that the world is much bigger than my little bubble here in San Francisco. And it made me really upset. Again, there are all these parallel lines that I'll always draw to this idea of just being human and being genuine. I was like, do people realize that I'm just a person on the other end of that picture? And it is really, really hurtful when you say something like that. And maybe they're just internet trolls that just hate everything. Even, even so, um, I just found it really offensive and really hurtful that someone would take the time to write something so mean when I am just a person here trying to like make my dream come true. Is that such a bad thing? Mm -hmm. And I was really upset by it. Um, and I've always had this really, I guess maybe – not connection because I didn't know him, obviously, but I always felt very close to the Matthew Shepard thing because he's my age. I mean, we are just, I think I'm maybe a year or two older than, than, than he uh, was. And um, the Matthew Shepard thing, I'm telling you, it's always been in my head. Like from the day it happened, like it just doesn't leave you. So, um, you know, I thought the thing that I could do here was at least fight back by taking sales during the two biggest months of the year, which were June and December, and donating a percentage of sales to the Matthew Shepard Foundation. I mean, to me, that was like, this is how I can fight back here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I think it, it all really kind of goes back to Christopher. It's just, it's me being me and not trying to put on any pretenses at all. And that's sort of maybe why I've supported um, some of the the gay communities. uh sort of uh charities or or foundations it's just it's me being me yeah it makes a lot of sense and i think it, it's true it's kind of comes back to the root of why you're doing everything you're doing because it's yeah just doing the things that matter to you well it's been like we mentioned it's been what four years or so yeah um I, i'm curious like what's what's been maybe some of the big surprises over that time because you know you had this initial Oh yeah. my God, I can't believe I'm doing it to, you know, mm -hmm. you're just about to launch this new spring line. Yeah. So yeah, some big surprises or maybe roadblocks or things that have gotten, you know, in the way. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of surprises. This has been the most incredible, the most, I, I describe it always as it's equal parts, completely exhausting and equal parts, completely exhilarating. It's both of those things all at once once. I think some of the surprises were, you know, I have a lot of experience in the clothing industry and in the apparel industry from a lot of different areas of uh, like the product pipeline. I've been in the numbers section. I've been in the merchandising section. I've been in the visual section. I've been in the design section. I have a lot of different experiences to draw from. Oh my God. 
when you are doing it on your own, it's a totally different ball of wax. And also, when it's your dollars on the line, you realize how important all of these decisions are. Um, that was a huge um, wake up call for me. Um, some of the other surprises, though, I think are more pleasant ones. Like, my God, people are so. I mean, I, I did speak to a little bit of the internet trolling thing, but the biggest eye opener for me was that people are so kind. One of the biggest fears that I had going into this was, oh my God, I'm going to get customers who are going to be mean or they're going to like send me back a pair of boxer shorts that are worn and expect me to like return their money. Like, I, I, <laughs> I don't know what made me think that the world was such a jaded place, but this experience totally wiped that slate clean. These customers are so kind. They are so nice. They are so encouraging. I mean, it's been astonishing to see that. I mean, it's like restored my faith in the universe. So that was a huge eye opener, I think, was just seeing the kindness that exists in the world. I mean, it's just been really cool. And I think the power of, I think I mentioned this to you in a different conversation was the power of these little networks and, and, and the six degrees of separation and, and how strong and how really fast things can grow for a little tiny company like me. I mean, that's kind of funny. Like people think that like blade and blue is this like big thing and no, it's still pretty much me in my basement doing everything. And, um, the fact that it's grown so much, I'm this, I'm one guy sitting here playing with fabric swatches and, and, and to see it grow so much in, you know, the first couple of years were definitely very tough, very tough and, you know, barely squeaking by and just, it was enough to just survive. But maybe the last two years has been just a mind blower. Like I can't even believe that people from around the world are buying a t-shirt that says the words blade and blue on it. I mean, that just blows my mind. Like when an order comes in from Switzerland and the only thing that they purchased was a t-shirt that says blade and blue on it. <laughs> and they want to pay $25 for shipping for that too. Wow. I mean, it's really, really remarkable. Um, maybe I guess another eye opener has been just that, my God, I mean, I'm saying this about myself, but it, I think it applies to anybody. I can do anything. I think at this point, this experience has shown me that I can do anything. And I, I kind of feel like anyone needs to tell themselves that too. Like you can do anything, but you just have to actually do it. Like I was talking about the clothing thing and making my own thing for a while there. And then one day I was just like, if I don't actually do it, it won't ever happen. And it will just be something that I talk about. So that's also been sort of an eye opener is that like, I mean, if I can do it and like you have noticed I can barely turn on my Mac. I don't know how to even do anything. The fact that we're having this conversation and the fact that I have a website, <laughs> anyone can do anything. You just have to do it. Oh, that's really powerful. And I, I think it's true. After a while, you start to realize you that's where the confidence comes in, even if you're nervous about something else that look, you really can do it. And I, and I also love that you said, but you really have to do it. You, like you, I, you just can't talk about it anymore. You can't. Yeah. Otherwise, all you're going to do is bore your friends to death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I do that with my friends right now. <laughs> yeah. what, what, what do you want to do that you're not doing? <laughs> I always have a zillion ideas, Peter, oh, yeah. that I'm like, oh, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And it's just that I get excited and I talk about them. And, yeah. you know, I know in the back of my head, this is going to take me a couple months to even get close to that idea, but I have it right now. So I want to tell you the five ideas I came up with today. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's part of it too. I mean, you know, I'm, I want to do so many different things on the site and um, I have learned over time that I need to control those ideas a little bit and um, edit down the number of things that I can really tackle. Again, you know, I don't have a huge team working on this. It is primarily myself. So, I can choose to sleep or, you know, start this next thing that I want to do. Or um, it's, it's, it's the ideas are, are very valuable because they're, they keep you going and they keep you energized. But knowing what you can successfully execute is a skill in and of itself. Oh, gosh, that's a good point. It's really true. You do have to kind of um, trim, trim as you go. That's actually yeah. a perfect lead in. I, 
I've been thinking about this too for a while because you've been doing, you know, uh, Blade and Blue for those last four years. Mm -hmm. uh, you had this uh, probably original idea or concept and, you know, our, our ideas are, they usually evolve after yeah. that initial concept, uh, you know, a few years into it. I'm, sure. I'm curious for you, like, how has your idea or visions changed over the last few years mm -hmm. than what it was initially? Sure. I think, I would think overall, I don't know if it's changed that much, but there's definitely, you know, cause I, I, I definitely still think about my father and my grandfather and those guys in those pictures when I'm putting together these looks. And I think to myself, would those dudes wear this? Would they think it's cool? Because similarly in 50 years from now, I would want someone to maybe come across a blade and blue picture and think to themselves, this looks really cool today and just as cool as it did in 2000 and 17. And that was the power behind those original pictures. There's been definitely a few surprises with this whole thing. And one of them was weddings. So, mm. you know, I put suspenders on the site. I mean, I just put them on because I love suspenders. I love wearing suspenders. I love the way they look. I love the way that they feel. And they definitely have an old school sort of vibe to them. But what I had no idea about was that there's this huge market out there for grooms and groomsmen parties and, and, and all things like that. So I didn't realize, I mean, in the beginning, I was really struggling to keep up with it. I mean, people would come and buy like 10 suspenders at a time. And I'm like, who are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and then they would send me pictures of their wedding parties and it would blow my mind to see like, all these dudes with the with the bridesmaids wearing the blade and blue suspenders or the suspenders and the bow ties. And then I started to get slowly, I got contacted one by one by brides or uh, brides-to-be or grooms-to-be. And they wanted me to make the bow ties and the suspenders for their weddings. Um, so that's been a, a definite <laughs> morph from the original idea and something that I had never anticipated. Um, and of course, I welcome it. I think it's the coolest thing. I mean, this is the most important day in these people's lives, and they are letting me be part of it. I mean, that's really, really cool. So I think later this year, I'm going to be launching a section on the site that is specifically for wedding parties. Mm -hmm. um, because I just never realized, and people are really stressed out about their weddings. I mean, they just want you to take care of them. And I think, again, there's that human element. I mean, they are getting a phone call. They are getting a note. They're getting their hand held by me in this whole process. And I think people really appreciate it because they have so much other things to worry about for that, that day. They don't need to worry about suspenders and bow ties of all things. So – um, I think that's been a total shift and I would say the boxer shorts has been <laughs> maybe something I could never, ever have anticipated. So, you know, I would say shirt and ties was what I started with shirts and ties and vintage tie clips and vintage watches. That's what I thought blade and blue was going to be about. And in many ways it still is, but this boxer short thing has taken off and, I mean, I don't really even know how to explain it, <laughs> except to say that people love these boxer shorts. So, you know, for me, I like boxer shorts a little bit more than I like like briefs or boxer briefs. But, you know, with pants being and jeans being so cut so slim, I, I can't wear boxer shorts anymore because they're all so big mm -hmm. and baggy. It's like wearing a big diaper. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll just try to make one. And I made one, and it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like I was wearing a straight jacket, and it was awful. It didn't breathe. It was terrible. And I sort of hung that idea up and said, forget it. I have enough to do just trying to make Blade and Blue survive. And then I had the idea, well, why don't I put some stretch into this fabric and try it again? And boom, I knew it was cool. It fit so well and so comfortably and I don't know. I, I just loved it. Then we put Brian in the boxers and mm -hmm. just went a little crazy. <laughs> I can't keep the boxer shorts in stock. And if anything, the only time people get angry with me is because I can't keep them in stock. And a lot of them sell out really fast and they can't get them. So, um, and they're begging, can you make one of the Paisley or can you make one of the Zachary check? And it's like, I just don't have the fabric. It's all gone. So that's been a huge shift for me. Um, 
again, I never would have expected it and never would have anticipated it. But I will tell you in the very beginning days, it was those suspenders and those boxer shorts that kept Blade and Blue alive until I would say about two years ago when the shirt business and the tie business started to really kick in. It was those unexpected things that kept me afloat. That's so, actually super smart. That's, I mean, smart for like, I just think it's to pay attention to that. Like it may not it go as exactly what you want, but there may be a surprise that does help you. Yeah. You got to go with the flow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I will take every bride to be who wants a pair of suspenders. from. <laughs> I mean, gladly. <laughs> you might not be the dudes in the photographs, but um, I know that I'm making her life a little easier and a little better with what I do. Sure. So, um, I never would have expected that at all. Um, so yeah, there's definitely going to be surprises if somebody else is going to start something like this or start, you know, their own endeavor. There are going to be detours uh, that you might not expect, but I would say embrace it and you know, don't just turn back around. Go down the road a little bit and, see, and, and and explore it before you just turn around because it wasn't what you expected. You know, same thing with those pictures like I was describing earlier. I walk into the photo shoots with very specific ideas of what I'm going for, but rarely do we actually use those pictures. The best pictures come when we catch the boys off guard or laughing or smiling or resting or just being themselves. So... You know, you can plan things as much as you want, and that's probably helpful and healthy to a degree, but be prepared to stray from that because, you know, no one ever gave us a manual that said life is perfect and everything will go as planned. <laughs> Nothing will go. Some things will go as planned, but most things won't. And you have got to roll with it and take those opportunities that are in the, the unexpected because they might help you. And for me, they definitely help because the boxers and the suspenders kept Blade and Blue alive in the very beginning when I was figuring out how to make great shirts. Um, yeah. Yeah. How, how, what? How, who or what inspires you? Because I think you have so much to do yeah. and there's always new you know, product to make and things to try, but but how do you stay um, inspired? Like, what does it for you? Um, I, primarily for me, it's going to flea markets and garage sales mm. and that sort of stuff. I, I just love looking at something old that is beautiful and that somebody created and it needs to find a new home. I just think there's something really cool about that. But I would say this is probably going to be sort of maybe – a little bit of an oblique answer, but it's the singer Prince. So I'm a huge Prince fan. You know, I'm a huge music fan. I told you that mm-hmm. earlier, but I'm a massive, massive Prince fan. And it, it's beyond the music part of it. I mean, the music to me is just incomparable. Fine. But for me, it goes to his philosophy about how he wanted to live his life. I mean, he'd made millions with Purple Rain and Sign of the Times and all that stuff. And he didn't really need a lot. But he was always fighting the system. And for some reason, I have just identified with that so much, particularly as I've been like wrestling with some of the struggles that I've had while working at a large corporation, right? Mm -hmm. Prince fought the system. He wanted, wanted to do things his way. He wanted control over his image, over his music. He was feeling robbed both spiritually and financially by the big system And he fought and he was ridiculed for a lot of what he did when he changed his name to a symbol or when he didn't play by the rules of the record industry. In the end, if you look in the 1990s, so many artists probably came and went that had number one songs and huge hits and huge albums. You probably have no idea where they are now. But I mean, up until the end, I mean, Prince, you know, he died last year. That was awful. But he was packing arenas up until the end. Mm -hmm. And to me, he came out the winner in the end and he did it his way. He took control over his life. He took control over his career. He took control over his art. And that to me is the most inspiring thing. Like I feel like I've taken control over my art now because I'm doing it my way. I'm not allowing it to be so watered down that I don't even recognize it anymore. And it is no longer soulful. 
or human, you know, back to those words again. So for me, that his experience and, and his fight has been a huge inspiration. And a lot of ways, I just, it keeps me going. Yeah, I, actually, I really, gosh, I, your answers have been really good today, Peter. <laughs> like, that's so good. I, I love that, that you're taking kind of control of it. And it's, and I like that you called it art because it's, oh, we, yeah. we've said product a lot, right? And I think mm. we can think about fashion and retail and that kind of stuff as that, as a product, as a business. Yeah. But this is, yeah, you're controlling your art because it's your voice and your, your vision, what you're bringing to life. Totally. I mean, my dad is an incredible artist. He is awesome. I mean, I wish that he would have allowed himself to explore it more, but you know, he was a garbage man and that was his life and he just worked and worked and worked to support us. He never really explored his creative side. I, on the other hand, cannot draw or paint to save my life. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, just can't do it. But for me, this is my version of art. And I think in some ways I'm honoring my dad because I'm allowing myself to actually explore this and not just suppress it and take that more like expected route in life. And, you know, my dad, when I was telling him that I was starting the business, um, I expected him to um, maybe shut it down or, you know, not be really supportive because they're old world Greek people and their life revolved around work and security. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know how he, or my mom really too, were going to react to me starting my own business. My dad, I could tell, was really supportive and really proud. And I know he was really, really touched when he, I showed him the watch section of the site. And basically the watch section of the site is like a love letter to my father saying, my dad was the best dad ever. He loved vintage he loved watches like that's what that was my dad's thing and he maybe once in a while he never spurged on anything for himself at all i mean he wore like the same shirt i think like my entire childhood but and like they never went on vacation nothing everything was save 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 and for the kids for the kids for the kids but the one thing that he really loved besides his art was watches so for me the vintage watch section was just like like really a tribute to my dad and um when he saw that section of the site, I mean, I can't really describe it in words. I could see it in his face. I could tell that he was just really, really honored. And that was a huge moment for me, um, for him to know that, like, he's inspired me too. You know, he showed me what it is to be a man. He, he passed on all these great traditions. I mean, every time I tie a necktie, mm -hmm. I hear my dad in the back of my head telling me, where to place the tie, where to, where to turn it over, where to flip it over, where to tuck it. I hear him when I tie. I wear, I'm wearing a tie right now. I wear a tie almost every day. And I, so I hear my dad, and I think there's something really cool about that tradition that he passed on to me. And I think what's even cooler about that is that I know that I'm not alone in that. I'm, I know that many guys probably hear their dads in the back of their heads when they're tying in their tie because that's who taught you when you were a little kid about who to do how to do that mm -hmm. um is that an answer to your question i don't know what the question was anymore <laughs> no it is and i actually i just love the story about your father and sharing him with uh, the watch section i think that's talk oh. about inspiration as well you know we talked a little bit about just we mentioned a couple times about the spring you know the line and it's going to come up soon so because oh, my, yeah. my next question was really going to be about you know what's next for blade and blue i'd love sure. to hear about yeah like maybe yeah what's immediately next and maybe what's coming down the future is you yeah. know further there's probably well there's maybe the, the one most immediate thing coming up is the launch of the new spring line and I think people will be really happy because they've been really frustrated because um, you know, over the holidays, so many things um, sort of sold out and they want to buy shirts and they want to buy short sleeve shirts. They want all these great, cool pieces of art, let's call it that. And um, I just haven't had them to sell because we've been getting everything ready and perfected. And um, so the new spring line is about to launch, I would say, in maybe over the weekend if I don't really sleep. It will be up by Monday, like, what is it, March 3rd, 4th, maybe March 6th or so. But um, so the new spring line is, is going to be up. And oh my God, I just, 
I mean, I feel like I say it every season, but I really feel like this season is really, really cool. Um, it all got inspired by um, a little trove of paintings that I found in a vintage shop in, in Cape Cod. So everything from the use of color, the use of these really, really clean lines, um, and a really like maybe a little preppier of a look, um, were all inspired by that experience. And I just channeled all that into... Uh, into the product. So I'm really, really excited about it. Um, so the new spring line is up. It's going to be really cool. And there's probably two next things that are on the horizon. One being that wedding section mm -hmm. that I mentioned to you earlier, which, um, is actually a lot of work, <laughs> and yeah. um, I wanted to have it up for wedding season this uh, spring, but I'm a little bit behind. And again, that would be probably one other thing I would tell people as you know they're maybe trying their own thing is just don't get discouraged. I mean, you might fall behind, and it doesn't mean that it can't happen. It just got to roll with it. So um, the wedding section is going to be launching later this year, and then I am working on an underwear line to complement the boxers. Mm -hmm. So um, that, I think, is going to be a little crazy <laughs> when it launches. I'm, I can, I'm I can, sure it will, especially because, um, as we know, um, if you put Brian in them, which, yeah. you know, will do well for you guys. That's <laughs> yeah, just he's, funny. He's, he's kind of a movie star, right? Right. He has um, become that for sure. Yeah, and the thing, here's the thing about him. He's, I mean, he's so, he's a beautiful person, like, to look at, sure. But he's, he's a really really nice guy and he's not only a nice guy he's a very smart guy mm -hmm. he is very very intelligent and um you know i bet people would be surprised by that because he's got such an image of such a you know handsome beefcake kind of thing so um Again, not everything is what it appears. He is a really smart and talented guy, but um i'm really excited to launch the knit underwear line I, I think it'll be ready in the fall i just need to make it perfect yeah. i mean the boxers are so um well loved that i need this to be uh to be uh equally as as good and um it's actually really really difficult because um you know underwear is kind of not forgiving and i <laughs> want it to feel special and i don't want it to feel like underwear that you could buy in a three pack for 20 bucks I mean, sure you know, I'm making it here in America. The yarn is even spun here in the United States. Like, I really want it to feel personal and, like, again, connected. Like, I'm connected to this. I know the person who is spinning that yarn. Like, like that's what makes it maybe a little bit more special than buying your three pack. Absolutely. You know? So, um, that is a really exciting uh, thing that's coming up later this year. Um, well, good. We'll look. A couple we'll of look. other things that I'm going to maybe keep myself sure but you need a little surprise so you can yeah, launch it exactly. yeah where is the best place for people to follow along not just the store but like where can they follow along with the story and as you unfold stuff sure i would say that the best place is at bladeandblue.com and if they actually just sign up for the newsletter mm -hmm. i do not bombard people with emails i can't stand it when Bloomingdale sends me something every single day. It drives me crazy. Um, I send something about once every two weeks just to keep people uh, informed about what's new on the site. Um, and again, I feel like that newsletter feels, I mean, it is me writing it. And I just, that's what I want it to feel like. Like, this is my chance to just connect with you, like, and really say thank you for being interested in what I'm doing. Um, and hopefully there's some things in there that you think are cool and that you might want to bring into your life. And if not, no problem too. But it's just a way to keep us connected is to sign up for that newsletter on the website. You do get a discount code if you sign up for it. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, and then the usual, the Facebook and Instagram, but I, you know, I admit I'm not great at that kind of stuff. So um, I would say the newsletter is probably the most me that you're going to get because it's me sitting there and expressing to you what I'm excited about. And um, I hope that everyone always feels in everything that I do, that even underneath all the words and the pictures and the colors, there is like an air of gratitude uh, that you're even reading or even looking at this picture. Because I am really thankful because there's so much to look at in the world now. There's so many different options for you. And um, yeah, it's really like important to me to, that people know that I'm really, really grateful. And I think that will really come through too. And I think that's the kind of even a big theme I've heard here is about, you know, putting that human spirit into it and your personality. Peter, yeah. this has been terrific. 
Thank you so oh, much for spending so much really time fun. talking about this. And <laughs> sure, like, it's like therapy. <laughs> well, it's interesting too because I feel lucky to have these conversations because I sit here and I think, oh yeah, I'm going to write that down. He just said something I've been thinking about lately, and gosh, yeah. that's like good advice. So this is really powerful. I mean, it's, I'm glad you thought of it as therapy, but I think it's really powerful for anybody that listens to hear. Like, yeah, you really can do this from the basement of your house. Like, it can happen. <laughs> you can. I mean, I I did it. If I can do it, and I did it while holding down a full-time job at the same time. I mean, like, it took every ounce of energy and passion that I had, but I did it. You know, I actually did it. And yeah. that, I think, is the biggest thing when I turn around and look back at the last four to five years, like, from the inception of it to when it launched and, and the growth that's been happening is, oh, my God, I actually did it. <laughs> it's really nuts. <laughs> so it's it's really satisfying and really fulfilling. So, um yeah, I mean, anyone can do anything because really, if I can do it, anyone can. I had no time, no money, and can barely turn a computer on. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's a perfect way to end this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how people should remember me. <laughs> you know, he can't really turn on a computer, but he can make amazing clothes. No, Peter, seriously, again, this has just been really wonderful. Thank you again. It's been great for me, too. Thanks for your time. So what'd you think? Any new ideas? Are you going to try something new? I'm always left feeling great and have a ton of ideas after these conversations. The guests are totally energizing me. Speaking of being energized, did you guys know about my Awesome Finds newsletter? Each week I share creative spotlights, meaningful stories, and new ideas to spark your imagination. And the reason I'm really doing it? I just want to share the great stuff in the world that energizes me to energize you. So if you want to sign up or you want to find out more information about it, go to awesomefinds.info. That's A-W-E-S-O-M-E-F-I-N-D-S dot I-N-F-O. Okay, back to the show. If you want to share thoughts about the guest or how the show sparked a new idea, I'd love to hear about it. You can call me and leave me a message at 1-707-347-9312. Just include your name and a brief message, and you may even be featured on the next show. If you want to follow along with me and see behind-the-scenes fun and my adventures, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at MeChristopher, that's M-E-C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R. You can also follow Accidental Information on Instagram and Facebook at Accidental Information and on Twitter at Accidental Info. Also, we publish original articles weekly about following your passions, getting creative, and a lot more, all at accidentalinformation.com. Lastly, if you love the show and want to spread the goodness, go tell a friend about it. As in literally text someone or go email it to them. I love it. Also, make sure you subscribe to receive new episodes automatically each week. Thanks again for joining the conversation. Okay, that's it. We'll talk again next week.